Okay, guys, this is our uh, 11th and final slide in our uh, Westward Expansion Unit. This unit's longer than most other ones. We usually won't have this many slides. But uh, anyway, uh, this one, finish up here. Uh, we talked about the, the rise of the Populist Party. Let's see them at uh, their, their height, their strongest here, in uh, the election of 1896, uh, presidential election here. Um, there we go. The, uh, we're going to have two main candidates here. Um, the populists uh, are, are, remember, they're, they're realizing if we're going to get anywhere, if we're going to win, we're going to have to work with another group of people here. And they choose the, uh, the factory workers, the, the urban labor in the city okay, to work with. Most of those people are Democrats. Okay. Most of the factory owners, the wealthy in the country, um, and their supporters are Republicans. So the, the, the average worker, most are Democrats. So what you end up with is a party here known as the Demo Pops, the Democrats and the Populists. Okay. Uh, so the Demo Pops. They will join together, uh, and they will nominate a uh, Nebraska congressman, so we, uh, he, he lives in the Plain States. He understands the farmers and all that. Uh, a man named William Jennings Bryan. And William Jennings Bryan is going to be around for a long time. Here you see the uh, uh, at the top of the page the political cartoon there that's typically known uh, called um, Spanning the Divide here. This is uh, William Jennings Bryan there. It's got the populists on one side and the Democrats on the other side, the populist platform, the Democratic platform, uh, spanning the divide, bringing the two sides together. There's William Jennings Bryan. Okay. Um, he is a, a brilliant young speaker, a young congressman who's uh, uh, going to make a name for himself here. Okay. He will be facing off against the Republican nominee, uh, former Ohio Congressman William McKinley. Um, and here you see a, a picture of McKinley down there at the bottom, sitting in his rocking chair there. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but uh, McKinley will sort of be the, uh, the face of the campaign. The former politician knows a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people like him. He's a good guy, friendly, outgoing. Uh, but the man running the show here, uh, the man calling the shots, running the campaign, uh, and really sort of running the whole thing, um, is a millionaire businessman named Mark Hanna. H-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Mark Hanna, millionaire businessman. He's the one getting all the money donated for the campaign. He's the one telling McKinley what to do. McKinley just goes out there, shakes hands, and be, uh, and will be his normal, you know, friendly, outgoing self. Okay. One of the key points of the campaign here um, is when William Jennings Bryan gives a very fiery speech known as um, the Cross of Gold speech. The Cross of Gold. Uh, and here you see a political cartoon uh, that appeared in newspapers at the time. Now think back to um, what we said the populists wanted. They wanted to coin silver. They want more money in circulation, making it easier for the farmers to pay off their debts. Um, that's inflation. Okay, prices go up, but so does income. There's more money out there. They want to coin silver. William Jennings Bryan gives a, a, a very fiery speech where he says, you Republicans, you are going to crucify mankind upon a cross of gold, that insisting on gold only, backing money, is going to destroy this country. You're going to crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Now, of course, he's hearkening back to Christ here, the Christ figure. Okay? There he is carrying his cross on his shoulder, holding his crown of thorns. This is William Jennings Bryan here, right? Um, this is the, uh, the speech that will win him the nomination and really set the tone for the campaign, that they're going to go after the Republicans um, and their insistence on gold only, backing money. Okay? Now, the populist's idea is... Um, 
it's a pretty simple one, okay? but it's going to be a very costly one for the Republicans here. So now stay with me. You got to understand this, okay? The populists are proposing coining silver at a ratio of 16 to 1, meaning okay, they want there to be 16 ounces of silver to every one ounce of gold. So they're not saying we want one to one. We want, you know, you can't you coin one ounce of gold, we'll coin one ounce of silver. They're not saying that. They're saying, look, 16 to 1. It takes 16 ounces of silver to equal one ounce of gold. Now that sounds like a pretty reasonable thing, right? Surely even the Republicans can't complain about that. But they do, because here's what I haven't told you yet. The market value of silver at that time. The market ratio of silver was 32 to 1. If you wanted to trade in silver for gold, it took you 32 ounces of silver to equal one ounce of gold. The Democrats and the populists want to cut the value of silver in half. This meant that the silver in a dollar would be worth 50 cents. So if you hold a lot of debts, you know, you've loaned money to people and you're waiting to get paid back, you're a banker, you're a business owner, you got a lot of money, suddenly the prospect that your, you know, $10,000 would only be worth $5,000. 16 to 1 is going to cut the value of money in half. So if you're a, uh, a debtor, you're a farmer, you're a factory worker, this is great news for you. If you're a wealthy business owner, this is horrible news. Right? So 16 to 1, it's going to cut the value of the dollar in half. Right? Now, the thought of their business is suddenly being worth half as much as they used to put a great scare into William McKinley, Mark Hanna, and the rest of the Republican Party. So Hanna goes out and starts raising money to campaign for William McKinley. He is able to scare the businesses so much that he raises $16 million in 1896 money. That's a whole lot nowadays. He raises $16 million for McKinley to campaign on. William Jennings Bryan and the Demo Pops are only able to raise $1 million. Ironically, the same ratio that they want to coin silver at, 16 to 1. McKinley and the Republicans will hold a huge campaign advantage here because of the money they can raise. Now we also, in addition to two different financial situations, we also see two different types of campaigning. Whistle stop versus front porch. William Jennings Bryan goes on what's called a whistle stop campaign. He gets on a train and starts riding all over the country. And the train would stop at every big city and small town along the way. They'd blow their whistle. You know, everybody comes down to the train station to see what's going on. William Jennings Bryan would stand on the back of the train, give a very fiery campaign speech, and you know, fire everybody up. The train would take off and go to the next town, and he'd do it all over again. William McKinley, on the other hand, runs what's called a front porch campaign, just what I was showing you a while ago here. William McKinley would sit on the front porch of his uh, his house there in his rocking chair, and the richest people in the country would come to see him. They'd sit down, they'd sip a lemonade together, he'd shake a hand, and he'd say, how much can I put you down for? And they'd write him a nice check uh, for his campaign. Okay. Uh, two totally different ways. William Jennings Bryan appeals to the popular or the, the, the populist movement here, average, common, everyday people. Um, McKinley is appealing to the rich. Okay. This also turns into a, um, a campaign of country versus city. Brian, obviously being the country guy, uh, appealing to the farmers. McKinley to the city, the big business owners in the city. Right. Now, notice I don't have a winner on there for you because I want you to think about this for a second. If William Jennings Bryan has all the farmers behind him and all the poor workers in the country behind him 
and William McKinley has only the rich behind him, who should win this? Right, it should be William Jennings Bryan. He has plenty of votes to win this. But he doesn't. You ever heard of President Bryan? No, it's because there wasn't one. We had a President McKinley. William Jennings Bryan will lose. Let me tell you how. When all those rich, wealthy businessmen would come to McKinley's front porch and they'd sit down and sip a lemonade and shake a hand and write a check, Mark Hanna, who was always there, would say to them, "Um, let's work out a deal here. And the businessmen would say, okay, let's work out a deal. The businessmen would say, um, or the government, let's say, you know, would say, uh, the we'd love to, uh, you know, Republican business people would go to the factory owners and they'd say, you know, we, uh, we'd love to put an order in. Let's say that the, the company makes, uh, I don't know, tractors, all right? We'd like to put in an order for uh, 5,000 of your tractors. Could you sell us 5,000 tractors? And the business owner would say, oh, you bet we could. Yes, that'd be great because he's going to make a lot of money, right? And they'd say, oh, well, wait, there's one catch. That order is contingent on McKinley winning the election. If Brian wins, the order's off. If McKinley wins, we'll buy your 5,000 tractors you're building. And the business owner would say, well, I I can't control who who votes for McKinley and who votes for Brian. They'd say, oh, I think you can. So the factory owner would go back to his factory, and he'd call all the employees of the factory together, and they'd say, uh, look, we got a we got a chance to make some good money here. We, you know, keep our factory open. You have a chance to keep a job. Um, all I need you folks to do, you know, is uh, on election day, go over there and vote for McKinley. And all the workers would say, I, I, I was going to vote for Brian. I don't want to vote for McKinley. They say, Well, I think you want to vote for for uh, for McKinley. They say, No, I don't. He say, Yeah, you do. Either you vote for McKinley, or don't bother coming to work the next day. You've lost your job. The factory owners would blackmail the workers. They had to vote for McKinley or they lost their job. Now, the more astute of you are sitting there thinking, wait a minute, how do you know who I voted for? It's because at this point in our country's history, we didn't have such thing as a secret ballot. Ballots were public. Factory owners would send somebody down to the polling places to make sure that the factory workers voted the right way. And with the thought of losing their job and having nothing, all the factory owners, or sorry, all the factory workers voted for McKinley. And McKinley will win this election. Brian did well in the South, he did well in the West. But the populace, the big cities of the Northeast, McKinley wins all of them. And he wins every state there, and he'll be the president. So, uh, power, money, politics wins out again. I'll see you in our next unit.